Hello, everyone, and thank you for making the time to join us on 10,000 Families uh, Study Facebook Live event. My name is Victor Ayara. According to the Centers uh, for Disease Control and Prevention, stroke is a leading cause of disability and death in the United States. It's the third leading cause of death in women and the fifth leading cause of death in men. Welcome to this edition of the program. And I am not alone as I do not have the ability or capacity to discuss this issue on my own or by myself. I have to interpret tonight, let me start with our ASL interpreter, Shelly. Shelly, thank you very much for always being here. And of course, the uh, guest that we have today is someone who is an associate professor in neurology at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Dr. Haitham Hussein. Dr. Hussein's specialty is stroke, and this conversation will focus on the prevention and the relationship between COVID-19 and stroke from a cultural community and gender disparities, disparities lens. Dr. Hussein is a researcher and educator, hospital practitioner and leader. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Hussein. Thank you, Victor. I'm is it okay if I call you Haitham? Yes, please do. Haitham, Haitham Hussein. Thank you very much. And uh, he is also the president, I am made to understand, of the American Heart Association. And that is the uh, Twin Cities chapter. Is that correct, correct sir? Yes. I'm Thank the you very president much. Elect. I president elect. President elect. Yeah. Thank you very much. And so that puts us in a great place to have this conversation because of the subject matter experts that we have today. Now, we've already presented your credentials. What can you tell us about yourself, Haitham? And why do you do this type of work? Thank you for the introduction, Victor. You're very kind. Uh, like you said, I, I am uh, my first name uh, pronounced Haitham, uh, Haitham Hussein. I am from Egypt originally. My father is from Cairo. My mother is from Giza. I um, grew up in uh, Cairo and uh, surrounded by a family of uh, physicians and academicians. I always wanted to be a doctor uh, since my childhood. I remember when I was uh, five, six, seven years old, I would go to my uncle's clinic. My uncle is an internist, and he had a clinic in kind of a simple um, part of um, Giza. And he would take me with him and I would see uh, he was very popular. He was very charismatic, one of those people who were kind of born to be a doctor, a helper. Uh, his patients loved him, respected him. They sometimes would come to him with their uh, psychological distresses, not necessarily with their uh, physical ailments. And he is one of those people who is really capable of empathy. He feels his patients. He lives with them in their struggles and in their um, moments of weakness and doubt. And, uh, and I think they uh, became more kind of reliant on getting that uh, emotional, psychological support, not just the, the medical care from him. And I remember very clearly people praying for him. I would uh, be by the window and see people walking down the uh, street, raising their voices with praise and prayer for him to hear. And so, of course, I wanted to become a doctor. I wanted to become like him. And then when I went to medical school, I was thinking that I was going to be a psychiatrist because both of my parents are professors of psychology in Cairo. And uh, growing up with, uh, with the knowledge about psychiatry and the field, um, 
the terminology was very common in our house, the um, topics, concepts. So I was very comfortable. And the only way we can become psychiatrists uh, through my medical school is by doing a residency that is a combined training in neurology and psychiatry. And I remember feeling kind of bummed. I would have to waste so much time doing all these neurology rotations when I knew I wasn't going to be a neurologist. And why would I have to study all of this and all of that? And lo and behold, after the first year, after six months of neurology and six months of psychiatry, I, of course, realized that I'm, uh, I'm going to be a stroke neurologist. And uh, it's, of course, the, the first uh, case that I saw treated uh, come with a stroke and treated that, um, that kind of uh, made, it, made the decision for me. Uh, I can tell you uh, that was an old woman who came to the university hospital. She was unable to speak and she was paralyzed on the right side of her body. And her condition looked to us neurologists uh, as if she is having stroke of her left side of the brain. And I remember my senior resident, I was a junior and I didn't know much. That senior resident was running around and preparing stuff and checking her blood pressure and all of that. And then he gave her that one expensive drug, IV injection. And then the next day, I come to the hospital uh, ward and uh, see that same woman standing and doing whatever stuff she was doing and by the at a drawer right next to her bed and that was magic for me that that was uh, the decision right there i really wanted to make that kind of impact on someone's life and the, the the amount of disability that stroke can cause is profound uh, in general any type of brain injury uh, the smallest amount of brain injury can cause severe disability that's not the case for other organs like the heart or the liver or the kidney. It's just the brain is very, very sensitive and can have a significant impact on someone's quality of life, someone's independence, uh, being able to walk and, talk and all that. So I really wanted to become that, that person who is waiting in the emergency room for that one stroke patient to come to give the treatment and reverse the effects of the stroke before they settle. I appreciate I you sharing, to, yeah. sharing that, that background with us, Ali, because it's really profound to understand your why before we have these conversations. And in listening to you, I heard you mention how your uncle's ability to empathize with, with, with people with, uh, you know, uh, psychological difficulties and, and problems and of course, your parents being uh, having uh, that uh, background in in psychiatry, in psychiatry, and psy psy uh, psychology, psychology. Mm -hmm. wanted you wanted to do that. But now uh, we are very lucky to have you at the University of Minnesota, where you are doing your best, not just impacting lives, but also molding other younger people, mentoring them to 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 become that kind of uh, person who, who causes such an impact in their world. Now, tell us about stroke and why is it called the silent killer? Well, uh, stroke happens all of a sudden. One minute the person is fine and the next moment the person is unable to move an arm or unable to see one part of the visual you know, field or unable to walk. And... Uh, until that moment when the stroke happens, the person is walking around and doing you know, normal uh, daily activities. Strokes happen from different uh, reasons. A very common one is this condition called hardening of the arteries. Another name for it is atherosclerosis. Hardening of the arteries is when um, the plaque, this, this gunky stuff, fat and um, 
some other you know components deposit in the inner lining of the artery and then these plaques get you know in to increase in size over time until one moment they close off the artery or they rupture and they send little pieces of this gunky stuff downstream and until that moment a person is just not aware of anything and as you mentioned stroke is the second or the third killer worldwide in the united states we are better so it's the sixth uh, or the fifth cause of death and in minnesota we are actually better than uh, many other states um, i think we're ranked 10th or 11th from the bottom in terms of stroke mortality compared to other uh, states um, but still you know it is a significant uh, condition that uh, causes um, it causes death and so it is silent because it evolves it the build up leading to the stroke a person is unaware of it high blood pressure is a condition that causes hardening of the arteries and people are not feeling anything when their blood pressure is high uh, sometimes when it's very very high especially if it increases all of a sudden people can get headache and change in vision and other things but for the most part the blood pressure is high and the people are walking around unaware of it high sugar is another risk factor high cholesterol another risk factor and people are just not are having any symptoms from these conditions that together help build up the plaque formation the hardening of the arteries or have an effect on the heart and then people would eventually have a stroke so uh, stroke is a silent killer and we all need to be aware of it we need to prevent it uh, before it happens and it's tricky because you don't feel different you're feeling okay why would i bother about preventing something and, and that, that i don't and that, feel and that really that that hi sam that really bring, brings me to the question that one of our viewers is asking now judy is asking are there any uh very early signs to prevent stroke so there are signs of stroke uh stroke happens when there is a blockage of an artery that gives blood supply to part of the brain when the artery is blocked the blood stops going to that part of the brain and then people start to have symptoms depending on where that part of the brain is is it on the right side the left side as you know right side of the brain controls the left side of the body left side of the brain controls the right side of the body if the artery supplies a motor area then the movement is affected so people get paralyzed or have difficulty heaviness weakness of one of the arms one of the legs one side of the body droopiness of the face uh, a loss of sensation of uh, one side of the body uh, speech impairment uh, could be difficulty expressing uh, yourself in words difficulty understanding when people talk to you or could be difficulty in articulation you talk and you sound slurred as if you're drunk or something when you're not uh, difficulty with walking another stroke uh, a warning sign and whenever there is a stroke warning sign people are encouraged are strongly advised to call 911 it's not your job to figure out if this is a stroke or not it's not your job to be sure suspicion is good enough if you're suspicious that you or someone you know are having stroke warning signs just call 911 come to the hospital it is our job to figure it out when you come now stroke prevention is before the stroke happens so it's a little bit more tricky because you're not getting any warning signs of stroke uh, you just uh, have to be uh, aware of your blood pressure we tell people you must know your numbers what is your blood pressure is your blood pressure well controlled or not controlled for those who have high blood pressure and take pills for it what is your sugar if you have diabetes do you have primary doctor that checks you every six months or every year for these conditions that are silent 
And if you don't look for them, you won't find them. So people should have a primary doctor and that primary doctor should uh, you know, work w- w- with them every six months or every year, do a routine checkup uh, about the blood pressure, the cholesterol, the blood sugar, and so forth. Um, and um, the one thing that I would say to uh, our viewers and our listeners today is that lifestyle is absolutely important. Uh, you know, we talk about treating high blood pressure by taking a high blood pressure pill, sure. But if you exercise, if you reduce the amount of salt in your food, if you lead a healthy lifestyle, you will have better ability to control your blood pressure. Sometimes even people would be on pills and with lifestyle changes, if they are consistent, they can decrease the number of pills they take or even come off the medications completely. But they have to do that, of course, under the supervision of a doctor. So Judy, what you can do is that you can look at your lifestyle and see what are the healthy habits that you have that you should increase on and what are the not so healthy habits that you need to reduce. People should stop smoking. That is, and it comes from an Egyptian. Everybody in Egypt (laughs) smokes and I know how hard it is, but you can't smoke. That's not an option anymore. Uh, You know, it's exercise, healthy food. That is what we all need to work on lifestyle change into the better. I appreciate you bringing that up because my next question to you was going to be, there are people who would argue that they lead pretty much a healthy lifestyle. Uh, But unfortunately, by virtue of what demographics they fall into, they are you know, some people say genetics, some people say it's hereditary. So would you tell us, uh, is there any group of people who are more susceptible to, uh, you, you know, a cardiovascular diseases and, of course, stroke? Very good. Yes, that's a very important question. And, of course, the answer is yes. Uh, some of us have um, genetic makeup, um, you know, familial background, that uh, has uh, higher uh, chances of having heart attack or stroke. Um, We were talking earlier about this condition, hardening of the arteries or atherosclerosis, this buildup of blockage within the arteries. You'll find, for example, that people from uh, Southeast Asia or uh, East Asia, so Chinese, uh, Japanese, uh, Hmong, Uh, would have this condition uh, affect the arteries inside the head more than it affects the arteries of the neck, for example. While in Caucasians, you might find the other way around. There's a lot more carotid disease in the neck than uh, disease of the arteries inside the head. So there are biological differences, for sure, by uh, race and ethnicity. Um, But um, more than that, there are some uh, ethnic or racial groups that have high incidence of high blood pressure and high blood pressure eventually lead to stroke or heart attack. Our African-American uh, population, uh, our Hmong population. In the state of Minnesota, we have uh, a lot of Somalis. Our Somalis have high blood pressure that is not very well controlled. And the reasons for the uncontrolled high blood pressure Part of it is genetics. Some races just have a tendency to have high blood pressure. Some of it is lifestyle. Some uh, groups in the community have certain foods that are uh, more um, consumed uh, among their community. Uh, Some of it has to do with personal choices uh, like uh, smoking and uh, alcohol use that can be more in some families than others. Uh, So it's a compound thing, and uh, we definitely recognize that the African-American population, the Native American uh, population, 
and uh, some of the uh, Asian, particularly uh, Hmong uh, here in the uh, Minnesota, uh, have high incidence of uh, stroke, have the stroke in younger age than the general uh, population and uh, have the risk factors not very well controlled. Uh, so uh, the other important thing uh, that I want to share with you, Victor, is that when we look at the blood pressure control, and I'm so emphasis, uh, emphasizing the importance of blood pressure here because it's the most important risk factor for stroke. We found when we looked at the percentage of uncontrolled high blood pressure, we found that in the youngest age group, people you know less than 30, the proportion of people who have poorly controlled high uh, blood pressure is the highest. And as people get older, that proportion decreases. And so people in their 50s or 60s have the lowest proportion of uncontrolled blood pressure. But you have to think, oh, that's a little bit too late. Why didn't you start early? You should have started controlling your blood pressure when you were 35 when you were 45, because the effects are downstream. You should have controlled it early on. And this high proportion of uncontrolled blood pressure in the young age is worse in racial minorities. So if you look at people who are younger than 40 or something, and you break them down into white, African-American, uh, Hispanic, and so forth, the worst people uh, with, uh, with the highest proportion of uncontrolled blood pressure is African-American and Hmong here in, uh, in one study that we just uh, finished. Okay, let, let, me, let me just jump in now. Um, hi, Sam, I want to ask you because um, based on what you have said, we have, uh, uh, particularly in the Midwest, because I used to live in the state of Iowa, the beautiful cornfields of Iowa, um, uh, which is close to Minnesota, which is close to Nebraska. And these states have uh, a very good population of immigrants who come into this country and probably uh, predisposed to, you know, these cardiovascular diseases we're talking about with high blood pressure, with stroke and all of that. And they are here in the States. In your experience, both as an educator and as a community, a person, somebody who works in the community, who also leads efforts of diversity and inclusion and all of that. What are we doing? How much are we doing? And how much is there to be done in terms of educating this population, knowing, understanding that there's a predisposition to all of these things? Do you think that we're doing enough? Uh, I think we're doing some. Uh, you know, good efforts, but definitely there is more to be done. Definitely a lot of room for improvement. Which is why uh, 10,000 family study is there, right? Exactly. <laughs> we 10,000 uh, family study is unique in that it has the desire to include uh, patients and our families of different racial backgrounds, racial ethnic uh, and ethnic backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds. And that way, by observing how things evolve in different families, in different cultures, we can understand. Uh, maybe those of uh, Middle Eastern background like me have uh, more uh, tendency to develop uh, heart disease or kidney disease when they have high blood pressure versus African Americans who would uh, have more brain hemorrhage or something like that. So uh, participating in uh, a population-based study like the 10,000 families is one of the important uh, uh, ways we can understand why there are differences and how to address them. Uh, and um, it's also important for the uh, medical school for the University of Minnesota and other, you know, uh, educational organizations uh, to uh, recognize and teach their uh, uh, trainees, their students, the existence of uh, healthcare disparity 
uh, and uh, the different ways, different uh, countries and different uh, communities are trying to address these. And um, of course, there isn't one solution that would work for everyone. Absolutely. But, There's no one size fits all. Right, right. Approach. And uh, in our practice, our doctors, our nurses, all of that, we need to do a lot more education uh, to show, you know, to demonstrate how these differences uh, can impact uh, the outcome of disease. Uh, so a lot, of course, is needed. Um, we have uh, done some work uh, in, in our community, a small effort, and we're planning more. Uh, and, um, you know, again, uh, it's, uh, it's an open field, Victor, and there is a lot more needed. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So I am going to speak in the voice of Laurie, who is one of our very esteemed viewers. Laurie said, is a, is a stroke possible if blood pressure is on the low side? Yes. Hmm. Uh, so stroke can happen if the blood pressure is very, very low. Because if there isn't enough blood going to the brain, then the brain will start to suffer from stroke. And the parts of the brain that will suffer the most are what we call the watershed areas or the border zone areas. So imagine there is an artery that's giving branches this way and another artery that's giving branches this way. And the, there is a little bit of um, a border zone in between them. When the blood, blood pressure is very low and the blood flow recedes, you can imagine how this part in between these two arteries will start to suffer from lack of oxygen, lack of blood, and start mm. to suffer stroke. Now, people who have blockage of an artery, carotid artery in the neck or one of the arteries in the head, the blood flow already is reduced through that artery. So the territory of the brain supplied by that blocked artery will also be affected more. Uh, so low blood pressure can, of course, cause uh, stroke. But what is a dangerous low blood pressure? That is not as um like hard definition as high blood pressure normal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80. uh 130 and high you know every time we check blood pressure we get two numbers a top number and a bottom number the top number is called systolic blood pressure the bottom number is called diastolic blood pressure regardless of the names but the top and the bottom numbers if the top number is 130 or higher, that is considered high blood pressure. If the bottom number is 80 or higher, that's considered high blood pressure. Now, many of us are walking around with blood pressure of 90 over 60 and we're feeling fine. That is um, not uh, dangerous because there, it's not giving any symptoms. Uh, the low blood pressure that we worry about is when people start to have symptoms of it. Common symptoms of low blood pressure is dizziness. You stand up and you feel lightheaded and woozy. Um, you feel uh, you don't have energy, pale. Uh, your heart is beating fast to keep up, to try to push you know, the blood flow to the heart. So people with low blood pressure would have their heart beating fast. Um, and, uh, you know, if it's very, very low, people might pass out or something. Uh, but we definitely worry more about high blood pressure, especially if it is sustained high blood pressure. You know that we humans, our pleasure, blood pressure fluctuate. If we're doing something physical or if we are watching something exciting, our, our blood pressure might momentarily go up and then we'll kind of reach uh, back to baseline after a little bit. What we worry about is that baseline. We don't want that baseline to be sustained, eleva sustained elevation of that baseline. And, um, but low blood pressure can, yes, can cause stroke in special circumstances. 
All right. Um, hi, Sam. Thank you very much. And if you're just joining us, this is 10,000 Family Study Facebook Live event with me, Victor Ayara. And I'm speaking with a neurologist and associate professor with the uh, University of Minnesota, Dr. Haitham Hussein. And we're talking about stroke. Do you know someone who is uh, suffering from stroke or do you know someone who is uh, complaining of having this problem of high, uh, high blood pressure? This is the time to tune in. Let us hear your comments and comment on our Facebook page and we would read your comments out loud. And I'm also going to confirm there's something that we usually do on this program. I will check in before I say it so I don't speak out of line if we're gonna do it today. But for those who stick around to the very end, there is always something. Uh, and so let me go back to you, Haitham. Uh, when people say, uh, this is the age of smart watches, I am wearing one, everybody's wearing one these days, and they kind of monitor their heart rate. What is the correlation between the heart rate and the blood pressure? Is there any? <laughs> Yes, there is, uh, but the correlation might be affected by medications. So the, the correlation is that uh, if the blood pressure is very low, the heart might beat very fast to compensate for it. Okay. Um, if uh, someone is under stress or uh, in a situation, a fight, flight, fright situation, the sympathetic nervous system will stimulate the heart to beat fast and the blood pressure to increase so that it kind of prepares you to defend yourself or to take action. Um, but uh, there are some medications that lower the blood pressure and at the same time prevent the heart from beating fast. Beta blockers, uh, so uh, the family of drugs that can cause that. And in these situations, people might have this low blood pressure without the expected uh, compensatory increase in heart rate because of the medication. The right. smart watches, the smart devices, they can monitor the heart rate. Um, we cannot still, we, we cannot use them in making a formal diagnosis, but Absolutely. they can be good to at least alert us uh, kind of attract our attention that something is uh, not right. And the most important thing is arrhythmia. Arrhythmia is the abnormal heart rhythm. It's not about the number of beats per minute. It's about the regularity of the heartbeat. When the heart is beating irregularly in a condition called atrial fibrillation or AFib, the irregularity of the heartbeat causes the blood flow inside the heart to become turbulent flow rather than laminar flow. And turbulent flow inside the heart will form blood clots inside the heart. And then these blood clots will break off and go with the blood flow until they reach an artery that's too small, they get and stuck, block it. and then it's a stroke. So if your uh, smartwatch has the capability of detecting arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, abnormal heart rhythm, that is good because then it can be accurate, it can be inaccurate, doesn't matter. You will tell your doctor and your doctor will investigate that. But I see that as the kind of a very useful uh, tool, um, if not for diagnosis, at least for alerting us that something is wrong. Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Haitham. Uh, let, let me go back to your work because, uh, you know, uh, it, it, you mentioned how you had made a detour from psychiatry to neurology just because of an experience that you had as a young resident. So as a junior resident. Now, I would like to know more about your work with patients in hospitals and clinics uh, can you tell us about a typical encounter with a patient and what do you notice first? What happens over the course of that visit? And how does that overall experience, not one, not two, not three, not four, 
how does that tie into your why of going into this field? Uh, well, I work in hospitals and in clinics. In the hospital, we see emergencies, people who come to the emergency room with uh, stroke symptoms that just started and uh, we, we get activated. The, there is something called a stroke code. The hospital activates the stroke team via that stroke code. We run downstairs to the emergency room. We see the patient right away. Uh, there is very important uh, focus on the story. How did the symptoms start? When did the symptoms start? When was the last time the person was feeling fine? How did the symptoms evolve over time? Because that is important for us to make the diagnosis. And then we do a physical examination. And so it kind of a, a neurologic examination. So we examine the strength, see if there is a difference right from left. We examine the eyes, we examine the face, um, we examine the sensation, see if people have loss of sensation on one side. We examine the coordination, how accurate someone is moving the fingers and the hands. And, uh, and then, and this all happened very fast. And sometimes people are, uh, our patients are just uh, taken aback by how we are on their, on their bed and many of us are around and asking questions and doing examinations and things have to move very fast. Because Victor, we have a window of time to treat stroke. It isn't something that is uh, open-ended. And every minute, uh, there is loss of blood flow to the brain. There is damage to uh, brain cells. So we will be fighting time. We want to give the treatment as soon as we can. And so we have to get the story quickly. We have to do the examination quickly. We spend a lot of time to organize our work with our colleagues in the emergency room, our colleagues in the CT room, the radiologists, so that how we can get everything done in the quickest way possible. After we get the story, we do the examination. Uh, the patient usually goes to take a picture of the brain, usually with a CT scan. We always look at the arteries of the head and neck. So the patient is in the CT scanner for you know, 10, 15 minutes and then back to the emergency room where we talk about the plan and how to treat. Now in the clinic, the encounter is different because it's not an emergency. Uh, maybe someone has a concern about uh, the risk of stroke or maybe someone had a stroke and is coming to get an opinion about preventing another one from happening. And that's a more relaxed environment. You know? So we still do the story, the history, the examination, there is usually pictures that have already been taken of the brain. We look at them together. It's very important for me and for us, you know, stroke neurologists, that we we create an alliance with our patients and their families. We have to be all on the same page, understanding what happened and how to prevent another stroke from happening. And I can tell you a story about. Uh, one of my patients who is now my friend, and I, I asked him and he said it's okay to tell his story. Um, a police officer, I, I, I used to work at, at, at a different uh, institution before I joined the university. And uh, a police officer in his office, um, in his 40s, not an old guy or anything, uh, and um, all of a sudden couldn't move the arm and fell off the chair. And uh, his uh, boss walks in, saw him on the floor, unable to speak. And uh, she, of course, also a police officer recognized right away that it was a stroke. She called 911. He was brought to the uh, hospital. We get actually notified by the ambulance on the way. That's an important thing I want to share with our viewers and audience here. If you have a stroke warning sign, calling 911 and coming to the hospital by the ambulance isn't only about how fast the ambulance will bring you. They also call us on the way. So we are pre-notified. We go down and wait for the patient to come. 
and that saves time. And again, we're fighting time. And so they called us, we came down, we saw him and he was starting to get better, but he was still having difficulty talking and he clearly had weakness of the right side. We took a picture, we saw that he had a blockage of an artery in the head. We gave him the IV uh, clot busting uh, medication and then we took him and did the procedure that we do and we pulled out the blood clot and he recovered. He has no symptoms uh, now from, from that stroke, which was going to be a disabling stroke for the rest of his life. And uh, uh, he told me, you know, and he, he said, it's okay to use that. So he said that I'm a police officer. People see me all the time and thank me and call me the hero and do that. But you guys are the real heroes and no one talks about it because I was going to lose my independence. I was going to be disabled and you saved me from that. And now he is a stroke advocate. He sits on the American Heart Association uh, board uh, here for the Twin Cities with me. And he and I went and gave some lectures to uh, you know some audience about the importance of lifestyle because Police officers, unfortunately, work hard. They don't always eat healthy, that kind of stuff. So uh, again, the focus on lifestyle. And so that was an encounter that I will never forget. And uh, I know my patient is now my friend. And I Absolutely. That, what a wonderful, what a wonderful, wonderful story. I mean, because uh, I, I would put it this way. Sometimes even heroes need heroes. Every hero needs another hero. So thank you for being a hero for our, our, our man in blue, who is also a hero to all of us. Yes. Uh, there's a question that I really, I think I mentioned this in my opening about how stroke affects women and men. Can you tell us about the differences and, and, and uh, you know, probably the, the, the propensity for women or for men to, 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 to suffer from stroke? Yes. Thank you for the question, Victor. Now, there are, of course, biological differences between men and women, and these differences have an effect on stroke. Um, there are different uh, hormones, um, levels of hormones in men versus women. And some hormones uh, can cause increased risk of blood clot formation. And so women over the age of 35, especially smokers, uh, estrogen can increase the risk of blood clot formations in these women. Um, giving birth, uh, the, uh, pregnancy and giving birth, it can also cause changes not only in the hormones, but also in the elasticity of the arteries. And so some uh, stroke, specific types of stroke have uh, higher tendencies to occur uh, right after delivery or in the last uh, few weeks of pregnancy. And um, the, the other important thing is um, the, the natural, even without the pregnancy and all of that, the natural composition of the walls of the arteries between men and women is a bit different. So with trauma, women are more likely to have a tear of the arteries in the neck than, than men, a condition we call dissection. And so um, there, there are these biological differences, but there are other differences that are unfortunately our own making. So for example, in uh, clinical trials, in the research that we do to understand uh, information about uh, stroke and brain and the treatment effect, unfortunately, women are less represented than men in clinical trials. And so the knowledge that we're learning when we see that one medication works or does not work, this information is based on a study that has a majority of men. We don't know if the majority was women, maybe we would find a little bit of different results. And uh, that is unfortunate. And we need to do more 
to encourage women to participate in clinical trials in medicine in general and in the field of stroke uh, specifically. Women also live longer and stroke is related you, to age. You, you just took that out of my mouth. I mean, <laughs> all the time, all the time, we tend, we men tend to just go early. We tend to just go early. Well, um, that's a story for another day. <laughs> yeah, but then there are other things that research have shown, uh, research studies have shown that some aspects of the care, uh, like uh, how much investigation we make to find out the cause of stroke, is less optimal in cases of uh, women compared to men. And it's not very clear why these differences are. Some studies also showed that there is a little bit of higher risk of complications after the stroke treatments that we give in women compared to men, although this was not consistently identified. Um, and so uh, women have their own set of uh, issues uh, that, um, that we just need to be more aware of. and. Um, I think we are beginning to realize that the medical literature in general and the stroke literature specifically is kind of based on uh, studies that have majority of uh, men. And now there is a push to investigate more um, women specific issues. And um, I hope that um, our uh, viewers and, and, and audience uh, understand that this exists. And if you are invited to participate in a clinical trial, um, I, I hope that uh, uh, our uh, women feel the, uh, feel the enthusiasm to you're, you're participate. Being, you're being very nice and kind by saying it the way you say it. I'm gonna say it my way because I'm not an associate professor, okay? I am not doctor anything. Look, women, I know y'all think that you outlive all of us, but take part in a study, like 10,000 family study, get to know what's going on, participate in clinical trials. That's me. I wouldn't say it like high time <laughs> <laughs> because I'm Victor, okay? Now, uh, just to let you know that we're going to announce soon based on contribution on being part of this show the winner of our gift card every episode every edition we usually give out a gift card which is important for you not just to join but to stay to the very end all right hi fam i'm not going to let you go without asking you this question we live in the age of COVID, okay it has come uh, to be something that we can't avoid in all of our conversations from early 2020 until date. We understand that you have seen connections between stroke and COVID-19. How are they connected and why should people be concerned or not? What should be done about that? Well, that's a very important topic and I'm glad that we are talking about this. COVID, we used to think that it is a lung disease when it first started. You know, people get it from the air, it goes into the lungs, give people pneumonia, difficulty breathing, coughing, fever, all of that. But now we know that COVID affects the entire body. Uh, the COVID uh, virus uses a receptor in the cells to access the cells. And that receptor is not only in the lungs, but it's in the arteries, in the veins, uh, and throughout the body. So people can have uh, inflammation um, in the brain, in the nervous system, in the liver, in the kidney uh, from, from COVID. Now, we uh, found that uh, if someone has a stroke and COVID, the outcome 
is worse than someone has stroke without COVID. The chances of disability, uh, the risk of mortality is higher when people have COVID on, on top of their stroke. We also have a connection between COVID disease and blood clot formation, especially in the, in the veins. You know, the arteries are these blood vessels that deliver the blood from the heart to different parts of the body, including the brain. And the veins are those blood vessels that take the blood away from the different organs back to the heart. And there are some important differences between the arteries and the veins. Strokes usually happen from blockage of an artery. Uh, and um, COVID uh, can cause blockage of the arteries, but much more likely it would cause blockage of the veins. And that can, uh, that can cause damage a certain type of stroke called venous stroke can happen from that. Um, we also found that uh, COVID increases uh, the, the severity of stroke so, and how bad the stroke is uh, and regardless of the age. We talk always about stroke being a disease of the old people. Young people don't usually have you know, high incidence of stroke unless in certain circumstances. But when COVID comes in the mix, now the effect of the age starts to go away because we see a lot young people coming with stroke uh, when they have COVID uh, infection. Uh, so that's why we are strongly encouraging everyone to get vaccinated because uh, preventing COVID is likely to prevent the other conditions provoked by COVID like stroke. Okay, thank you so much, Haitham. And, and uh, I apologize to one of our viewers, Aladi, who was asking, how can blood pressure be controlled? Uh, you, you have told us about how blood pressure can be controlled through limiting salt intake, uh, exercise. What are re other recommendations do you have for Aladi, who is asking how it can be controlled? No smoking because smoking increases the blood pressure. Um, alcohol increases the blood pressure. Uh, so we, we want to be aware of that. And we, when we say exercise, we're talking about aerobic exercise. Aerobic exercise and like uh, jogging or brisk walking or biking, running, swimming, something that moves the big muscles of the body and makes your heart beat fast and you start sweating a bit. That's what we mean by aerobic exercise. And we like people to do 150 minutes of aerobic exercise in one week. If you divide them down by 30 minutes, half hour intervals, that's five times in a week that you want to do half hour of aerobic exercise. That should be your goal. Uh, we found that this is protective uh, from heart attack, stroke, and even dementia. And you must start it in the middle age. Don't wait. Start as young as you can. Build the habit. Thank you so much. We are out of time, but we do have a gift card winner. Our gift card winner for today is Laurie. Congratulations, Laurie. And you can email us to claim your card uh, using the email address 10 kfs at umn.edu very shortly okay it's right there it's scrolling 10kfs at umn.edu and you're going to get that gift card and of course um let me just uh in this is going to be something out of your work because you uh you wear many hats you are president elect of the aha you are a, a lecturer and you also find time to work with kids. In addition to your work as a university professor with, and with patients, you have worked with middle school students and particularly uh, the Hmong students. What did you do with them and what were the goals that you were looking to achieve? How did it go and what impact 
did it have on those kids and their families? Yeah, so um, one of the things we found, we, we studied our stroke patients and we compared the stroke by race. And we found that among stroke patients have uh, their stroke 10 years or 11 years younger than the, the general, the rest. And uh, they tend to have poorly controlled blood pressure. They tend to have much worse diabetes. So the risk factors are not well controlled. And so we tried to reach out to the Hmong community and we did a number of things. One of them was this program that we did with one of the uh, Hmong middle schools. We partnered with uh, a, a science teacher. We had a science uh, unit uh, that was dedicated for stroke, teaching uh, kid, students, I should not say kids because they get it, teaching <laughs> students uh, what are the stroke warning signs and calling 911 if there, if there are any stroke warning signs. And then we brought the students to the hospital. We give them a tour. They saw where the helicopter lands. They saw where the CT scanner is, what's gonna happen if someone comes with a stroke. We had um, a simulation event in our hospital also. One of our nurses played a stroke victim and uh, the students were supposed to identify stroke warning signs and call 911. Uh, and an EMT played the 911 responder, so the kid would call and explain what happened, and they they would be asked questions about what they're seeing. And so it was a stroke education program, and it was so much fun. Uh, we tested the students; they did well, and then we waited four or five months, I think, and then we tested them again. And now we are working on a project. We're trying to do the same, but on a bigger scale. We're looking for uh, teachers and students who might be interested. We want to, again, have this focus on uh, uh, difference by race or ethnicity. So we want to st start by three or four hospitals with high uh, representation of racial minorities, test everybody about their knowledge uh, about stroke before we do any education so that we can identify if there are differences by race and then deliver our stroke education program and our uh, medical students are working with me on that and I'm just delighted because they are just full of energy and they want to do uh, as much community outreach as I. And then we'll test the kids at the end and see if they learn something and hopefully they will. And, and so are you, that. sir. You said your students are full of energy. You, sir, are full of energy and it's been an absolute, absolute delight speaking with you wow time has really gone but yeah. i wish that we had more time i just want to thank our viewers that tuned in we have been speaking with dr hussein who uh, serves on the department of neurology's diversity equity and inclusion committee he is an associate professor of neurology at the university of minnesota he is also currently the uh, uh the a fellow of the american academy of neurology and the president-elect of the American Heart Association, Twin Cities. It has been a pleasure speaking with all with you, uh, Dr. Hussein. Thank you for coming on the program. And of course, our uh, ASL interpreter, Shelley Lenner, Andrea Hickel behind the camera, Clement Wilcox, of course, Sadie. My name is Victor. Do not forget to join us in January 2022. It's been a pleasure on 10,000 Families Facebook Live event until we come your way next year. Wow. Stay tuned. Bye-bye.